is the hot zone. Engaging with the news in a whole new way, international war correspondent Chuck Holton brings insight into areas of crisis and lets you help those affected. Hey folks, Chuck Holton here. Welcome to the Hot Zone podcast. Uh, It's Christmas season and we've got a lot of things going on here at the house. And so what I'm going to do for today's podcast is show you one from about a year ago that hasn't gotten a lot of views, but it should have. And we've picked up about 3,000 new subscribers on YouTube over the last year, as well as new uh, places where we are uh, putting out our content on CBN News, uh, New Right Network, uh, Mammoth Nation, and other places. Uh, So welcome to all of our new uh, subscribers. And you probably haven't had a chance to go back and watch this episode about what's going on in Nigeria with ISIS and Boko Haram. That's really important because what we're seeing right now, even in the last 24 hours, we've had uh, hundreds of students that disappeared from a school in northern Nigeria when gunmen came in and attacked their school. Unfortunately, the prospects of finding these people alive, again, is probably not very high. Uh, they are absolutely persecuting Christians in Nigeria. Uh, Nigeria is a huge Christian population, but uh, there are segments of that population that are being heavily persecuted right now, and the government of Nigeria is doing very, very little about it. So I want to show you this report about that that I filed after returning from Nigeria last year. Check it out. Hi folks, Chuck Holton here. You know, I was over in Nigeria back in July and while I was there, six aid workers were kidnapped on the road to Mighty Guri, which is north of Abuja, where I was. I was actually trying to get to Mighty Guri to report on the fight against Boko Haram because the Nigerian government and the Nigerian army have been there, well, 10 years really fighting Boko Haram in that area. But Boko Haram actually owns and manages about four out of 10 Uh, areas, major areas in that province up there, uh, Borno province, right up near Lake Chad. And it's the the Nigerian government is, some people say, losing that fight. Bottom line is ISIS has declared a caliphate in that area, and they are making good on their promises to kill every Christian they find. Uh, Just yesterday, they killed two Christian aid workers from that group of six that were captured back in July. Uh, I think a week ago, they killed another one of those. And they say they're going to keep killing as many Christians as they can find and driving them out of that area. So uh, that's exciting. Well, the more interesting development here is that the Nigerian army is saying that these humanitarian aid groups were working in that area because there are hundreds of thousands of people that have been driven out of their homes or living in camps up there. Uh, they say these aid groups are actually working with the terrorists. Now, now we're not talking about just any aid organizations. These are major groups, major funding for aid that takes place in these areas. One is Mercy Corps, which you've probably heard of, Uh, UNICEF, everybody's heard of them, and uh, Action Against Hunger, which is a large aid organization out of Paris, France. All of them have seen their offices shut down over the last few weeks by the Nigerian army because the Nigerian army says that they are supporting these terror groups. Now, I think what you have to read between the lines here, they're not intentionally supporting these these terrorist groups. But what happens is you've got a tremendous amount of aid in that area, a tremendous amount of money coming up there to purchase that aid. And all of a sudden terrorist groups show up. These guys look just like everybody else. And so either they walk into your office one day and say, Hey, if all of you want to be alive tomorrow, we need some of your budget and they'll just give it to them. Or those people come and they walk right in with the refugees and get in line and get food and aid uh, and shelter and that sort of thing because they're not wearing uniforms. They're not carrying weapons at that point. And then they, once they're fed and everything, they walk off and go pick up their weapons and go fight the Nigerian army. But the Nigerian army says that they have unequivocal evidence that these aid groups are supporting these terror groups. Now, they're not saying they're doing it intentionally, but nevertheless, And, you know, that brings up a really interesting question. How do you do aid right? 
Because one of the things I've seen around the world as I've done this job for so many years is that so often aid groups come in with the best of intentions, but they actually end up doing more harm than good. The short-term mission trip has become a summer fixture for Christian churches around America. They raise support in a variety of ways, then head out to take the gospel to unreached people around the globe. When they return, the kids can't wait to share their experience. They're fired up, at least for a while. And what about the mission fields they visit? Ask around, and you might find a different perspective. Career missionary Wilma Forster. There have been teams that have come down of young people. Their hearts are in the right place. They love God. But a team of 125 people, the logistics are huge. It creates a burden instead of a help. As a missionary in the bush of Africa, I've got everything I can do as a missionary to, to be a pastor of a local church, to meet the needs of my own family, includes my own children and their education, their schooling and all that. And with limited funds available, it, it does put a strain on you. One argument in favor of short-term trips is they lead to career choices in overseas evangelism. But according to a study by the American Society of Missiology, that connection isn't so clear. The study points out that while short-term missions have surged in the last 20 years, the number of new missionaries has actually declined. In Panama, I met one of those who recently answered the mission's call. Philip Brummett brought his family here a couple years ago after a short-term trip introduced him to the Kuna Indians. I'll always have a, a special home in my heart for short-term missions because if it wasn't for short-term missions, we wouldn't be here. But once he began living among the Kuna, he started seeing the effect of short-term groups on the tribe. Our hope is that we give them the resources that they need and let them take it for themselves. But when the short-termers come over and do the work for the nationals and then leave, there's no ownership that has taken place. After one mid-sized church sent their youth group down for a week, Philip was amazed at the cost. The money that they spent on food alone was enough for us to pay for one of our week training uh, for 30 of the, uh, of the Kunas on the island. But what about evangelism? Don't these trips usually result in locals being saved and kids taking that change back home? I had seen someone share the Jesus film over three nights and a handful of people got saved. And the last night they let a, there was a Kuna pastor that preached and 35 people got saved. He preached in his own language to his own people, his own heart, and that made a tremendous impact. Do you want to be saved? If so, raise your hand. Everybody raises their hand, and uh, then they pack up and leave. And then the following Sunday, and the following Sunday again, and the following Sunday again, you don't see these people in church. A lot of people in our community have been saved uh, numerous times, but there's no change in their life. Jason Lowe heads up short-term missions at his church. Well, I think you have to balance those two things. Uh, sending money, we do do a lot of that. We do send a lot of money. But my thought is that in taking people down there and allowing them to see it, you're raising up a generation of people who value missions. Then they're able to, I think, give more and stirred to give more. And it's, it's more of a reality for them. But the current trend is disturbing for missions organizations. Overall giving to missions has been declining lately, despite the increase in short-term missions. That means it takes many missionaries twice as long to raise the support needed to make it to the field. Stu Kinneborough is involved with a master's mission, a huge center that trains missionaries for long-term service. He says the priority shouldn't be short-term. There's over 6,000 unreached people groups in the world, and short-term missions can't get to most of them. The percentage of income that people give to the church has been declining in recent years, and of that, only about 1% is going to support missions. The solution is more long-term missionaries. We need more career, career missionaries. The fields are still wide under harvest. But what we see in missions is the other end of the spectrum. Every year, short-term missions is increasing. The church in America has to, to sooner or later sit back and figure out the expense that the church is going through yearly to send people overseas. We should be seeing more career missionaries. In fact, the opposite of that is true. We're seeing less and less career missionaries. None of the missionaries I spoke to said that we should stop doing short-term missions, but rather we should refocus our efforts to make sure we're spending our missions dollars as wisely as possible and not neglecting those who have given their lives to full-time service. 
One of the things that I like about short-term missions is it allows the people that go to really have a life-changing experience. And when they come back to the States, they realize what a privileged, blessed life that we have here. There is nothing wrong with a Christian taking a vacation to the mission field, but let's not call that missions. Experts coming down are helpful if they're coming down to minister and they're not coming down just for a vacation. There is something in giving your life to something bigger than yourself. And in every aspect of my life, it is to, to reach people for Christ and to see them grow in the faith. Now, we're not talking about just short-term aid groups either. Uh, what, one of the things I think I mentioned the other day is that we've seen where aid groups have come into Africa. And they've seen that, oh, gosh, the people here are, you know, kind of very, very poor. They need some, you know, uh, diverse, diversity in their food source. And so they bring in massive amounts of grain, let's say, to feed these people and about half of it ends up getting made into beer. And now you've got an alcoholism problem in a place that never had alcohol before. Uh, then you the 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 men who were herding their sheep and goats stop doing that and go lay under the tree drunk and their sheep and goats wander off and get eaten. And so it ends up being making the situation worse, not better. There's a great book on this subject called Who Really Cares? And it talks about the four directions uh, of it, relationships that people have. When we show up in a poor community, uh, the people there have relationships with each other. That's this direction, uh, horizontally. They have a relationship vertically with, with God and with themselves uh, and then they have a relationship outwardly with their environment. And if our aid doesn't help them get better in all four of those areas, then we're actually doing more harm than good. We have to be very careful about that. I've seen many, many instances where trying to do good things ends up doing bad things. And one of the things we're seeing in Nigeria right now is that uh, Boko Haram, uh, there's so many people that are fleeing the violence up there that they're, they're inundating Chad next door at, or going up into Niger. Uh, north of that. So uh, there's a guy named, his last name is Baloch, that just gave, from the uh, United Nations, who gave a report about this. Here's a, just a one minute excerpt of what he had to say. People leaving Nigeria and arriving in Niger's northeastern Maradi region speak of witnessing extreme violence unleashed against civilians, including machete attacks, kidnappings, and sexual violence. Uh, the majority of the recent arrivals are women and children. People are fleeing due to multiple reasons as far as we understand, including clashes between farmers and herders of different ethnic groups, vigilantism, as well as kidnappings for ransom. These attacks and, uh, and this violence against civilians now uh, has forced 20,000 refugees into Niger. Uh, and as refugees continue to arrive, the fear is uh, if this violence goes unchecked, uh, more people could be displaced internally and also in, into Niger. The reality is that people who come uh, or who have arrived in Niger speak of, uh, of extreme violence against civilians and also the reality that 20,000 are now refugees in Niger. The worry is uh, this adds a new dimension into the ongoing conflict uh, that is already affecting Nigeria. So obviously, after you watch that last piece that I, I talk, aired talking about short-term missions, you know that there are some real dangers to short-term missions that we have to be very careful about. And at the same time, we need more long-term missionaries. We need more lifetime long-term mission missionaries to go into those places where either short-term mission groups can't go or where there are... Uh, too many. I mean, where where they need that long term presence, people to come and do life with them. That's one of the things we've seen here in Panama. And so the problem with that is many people coming from your typical suburban middle class middle class raising in the United States try to go to some of these places in say the eighty twenty window over in, in in Africa or the Middle East and. They get killed. I mean, these are non-permissive environments, places like Jordan, Saudi Arabia, places like Morocco and, and different places all over Africa. And so there's a special training academy called the Master's Mission that was built just for that purpose, to train American missionaries coming out of that comfortable middle class life to live in a non-permissive environment and thrive there 
and bring the gospel to those places that are far, far off the pavement. The Master's Mission was founded by the Teasdales, a family of missionaries that's been working in Africa for four generations. Jim Teasdale has lived in Kenya for most of his life and will soon return to the States to head the Master's Mission. Long-term missions is on the ropes and the majority of the people in the world that are still unreached with the gospel live in very austere, remote environments that the short-term missionaries are not getting to. Most of our missionary force is coming out of middle-class suburban America, and they're not equipped to go into those environments and get the job done. The vast majority of the resources of the American church are going to short-term missions, which means the few long-term missionaries that are there have fewer and fewer resources to work with every year. Loingalani is a village that sits on the shore of Lake Turkana in northern Kenya. It's one of the most remote corners of Africa. The people here say it was the last place in the world to make it on the map. When Jim Teasdale moved here with his family 15 years ago, the four tribes living in the area were at war with each other. There was no electricity or clean water. When we first got here, we were camping for the first three months. I was cooking on three rocks, hand washing the clothes. Jim had come up previously, like a few months before, put a shipping container down. So what we did was sleep in the shipping container, and then we camped and lived out in front of the shipping container. So I think it helped us to spend time with the people and get to know them and to let them see that we're very much like them. And yet we, we did it with joy. It was a lot of fun. Over the next several years, Jim and Barb used the skills they learned at the Master's Mission to develop a spring and install water points for the community. They built a house, complete with wind power and a workshop. They also started a local church. A missionary coming to an unreached area has to earn a hearing. And the best way to do that is just simply fulfill the biblical mandate, love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, and so we, when we do that, that means trying to get clean water for our neighbors, trying to bring security for our neighbors. Without security, you don't have anything. Uh, trying to meet their medical needs, uh, just anything that, that we would like to have ourselves. Today, Jim is using his experience in Africa to help other aspiring missionaries make it in third world countries. Okay, but Master's Mission also does weapons training. How does that jive with being a minister of the gospel? Proverbs chapter 24 uh, says, if you see your neighbor being led away to slaughter and you can intervene and you don't, God sees, and he'll hold you accountable to, for the blood of your neighbor. Master's Mission is probably the only mission agency in the world with a first-class firing range. We give our missionaries uh, weapons training so that they have the capability to protect themselves, their families, and their neighbors. Security is more important now than ever in this area. Just two nights ago, there was a big firefight right here behind me as bandits came and tried to steal some camels from the village. Fortunately, they were driven off by armed policemen, armed by the government of Kenya. But Jim says the risk is worth it. The missionary force from the American church in Kenya numbers about 1,200 people. The vast majority of those reside in part of the country that has already been reached with the gospel. There's a lot of places in the world where an American missionary can go and be safe and comfortable. The parts of the world that are not like that is where the unreached people are. And that's where we need missionaries. Folks, the Master's Mission is one of the most amazing places I've ever been. And it's one of those things that I kind of go, man, I wish I could just sign up just for the knowledge that they get. Being able to learn to build houses and work on vehicles and uh, develop you know, springs for water and stuff like that. It's just a pretty awesome place. And I highly recommend you check it out if you have any interest at all in ever becoming a long-term lifetime missionary. We need more of those, so I hope you'll consider it and pray about it. Uh, that's all I've got for today, folks. Thanks for watching The Hot Zone. I'm Chuck Holton, and we'll see you back here tomorrow. The Hot Zone is produced by Amy Holton and Live Fire Media. Copyright 2019.